Thank you very much. I have to say, Brown, that was a very, very hard act to follow. Um, so, the title of my talk is What's Wrong with Patient-Centered Care? And I think that many of you here perhaps have never thought that there was anything wrong with patient-centered care, because on the face of it, it makes such sense. But I hope in 30 minutes' time that at least some of you will uh, think maybe a little bit differently about it. So, speakers often stand up and say thank you very much for inviting me to this particular meeting, um, and, but I want to go a bit beyond that because I'm really, really pleased to be here today, and for at least two reasons. The first is this. Um, when I was researching my book, I got very interested in the, the work of Steve Bergman, a.k.a. Samuel Shem, who wrote the, in the... It was published in 1978, I think, and it was the sort of 1978 version of This Is Gonna Hurt, um, Adam Kay's book from a couple of years ago. And uh, I found a video that he'd done uh, on .md from .md 2016, if I'm honest, it's also the case that when you're researching, it's incredibly, uh, it's always good news if you find a great video, because you can, you can tell yourself that you're working very hard as you watch it. But it was a great, great talk. And then, of course, I had to watch all the other videos of other people as part of my research. And I wrote to my publisher, uh, emailed my publisher the next day and said, I really, really want to be invited to .md. So when, when that email came in, that was good news. The second reason is actually a little bit more personal. And Dr. Louis Kerwin was my grandfather. Uh, he was a GP. He, I am the youngest child of the youngest child, so he died quite a, a long time before I was born. I never, I never knew him. But he did uh, his medical training in Dublin. And so on the few occasions when I've been invited to talk in, in Ireland, I feel a sort of link with my uh, grandfather who I never met. I have to say more recently, since 2016, I've been quite annoyed with him because he wasn't born in Dublin. He went to Dublin as a two-year-old and then was brought up. Now, had he been born in Dublin, <laughs> had he been born in Dublin, I could have had an Irish passport. <laughs> very, very selfish of him to have just been born two years too early. Anyway, so as has already been explained, I'm not a, a, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a psychologist. And for the last 20 years, slightly started uh, actually in 1998, so 21 years, I've been working with doctors. First of all, in a rather odd job, when I used to go and shadow consultants and then coach them to be more effective in their teaching. And then for about the last 11 years, I've been doing a job which is more usual for an occupational psychologist, uh, acting as a sort of career counsellor, but specifically for doctors, the very occasional dentist. Um, what I offer, it's not psychotherapy, and it's not career guidance, it's something in the middle. So it's a short-term, four to six session, focused exploration of what, of the psychological aspects of their work. And it is this, my, my, approach is very much informed by the fact that I had spent the 10 previous years watching doctors at work. So, what, what do doctors write to me about when they email me the first time? Well, uh, this is the, these are just a couple of emails, recent emails that have landed in my inbox, and they give a sense of uh, uh, the sorts of concerns. So, and I've obviously anonymized them. I was wondering if you could help me. I came to medicine late in life and was proud of my unusual rag-to-riches success story. After medical school, I secured my dream foundation post. I completed these, although at times I can only describe my feeling towards working in medicine as disappointing. I started specialty training last August, and the last year has been one of the worst of my life. 
This is due to a complex combination of personal and work-related issues. I consider myself a resilient person, but I ended up feeling emotionally traumatized by work. I made the big decision and resigned from my post. I need help, as this is the first time in my life when I don't have any clear focus. Plus, I've worked so hard and made so many sacrifices that I don't know if I'm suited or want to continue in medicine. There must be an answer. Second one. I've found myself on sick leave for burnout again, and this time I'm very reluctant to go back to work, but unable to cut the cord, and unsure if I want to, to move forward. I used to enjoy my job, and only nine months away from completing my training, I've sought support, which I found useful in the past, but the action plan we came up with previously has fallen through, and I feel once again where I was before. Well, since the publication of my book last March, I've had about a 1,000 emails of this sort. Um, the first few weeks after the publication, I had to take my phone number off my website uh, because I was just being phoned all day long. And some of the people, some of the people who've taken, upset, uh, taken exception to what I've written and, uh, about the, the medical uh, profession, a joke about neurosurgeons that I'm not going to go into, um, they will say, well, you, Caroline, you don't see a random selection of doctors. And of course, that is correct. I don't see a random, uh, and I'm aware of that. And if we, I draw a parallel with GPs, a GP may have uh, 1,500, 2,000 patients on their books, but they don't see a random selection of those 2,000 patients. Old people who are elderly, people with chronic diseases, they're going to see much more often. And I, I of course, the people aren't going to come banging on my door if they are loving their work and everything, so it's not a random selection. But, and this is the crucial point, I don't see outliers either. That's the, that's the bit. It's not just a tiny little, at the end of the normal distribution. I know that I don't see outliers because of the volume that approach me, and I know that just because of things like if we take a 2016 survey from the Royal College of Physicians, uh, what have we got? 80% of doctors felt that their work sometimes or often caused them excessive stress. Nearly one in five had to carry out clinical tasks for which they had not been adequately trained. Quarter felt that their work had a serious impact on their mental health. And crucially, nearly half felt that poor morale had a serious or extremely serious impact on patient safety. This is just one example. There are many, many others. So, yes, I don't see a random sample, but, but also these issues are not just things which matter to a tiny, a tiny amount. And we know, you know, all the pressures that the services are under. This would be from the King's Fund about in terms of... Uh, number of people seen within four hours of arrival uh, were the equal worst it had been, tendencies at A&E, admissions from A&E, it sounds like Brian knows that, that's also the case in, in Canada. And crucially, it's a, this is the case uh, really across the developed world. And Tate Shanafelt, who I've never met, but is a hero of mine, he's an oncologist, previously at the Mayo Clinic, now uh, at Stanford Medicine, and who's done some of the best research on burnout, talks about the fact that there's an aging population, rapid advances in medical knowledge, uh, Brian has talked about this, exponential growths in the number of treatments. So that's increased the volume of patients needing care and the complexity. And then we've had the response to that in terms of efforts to reduce the cost by increasing productivity, increased regulatory requirements, increased clerical burden, and this is the point. All of these undermine the human interaction at the heart of healing. And I think he concludes this paper by saying, collectively these forces have created a protracted interval, a protracted period of doing more with less, 
while simultaneously eroding the meaning and purpose in the work of health professionals. I wonder if there is a single healthcare practitioner in this room who hasn't sometimes felt that, that they're being asked to do more with less and somehow the meaning and purpose. This isn't only about doctors. I can say that as a psychologist. It's a, the nurses, the physios, the speech therapists. I doubt that there is anybody in this room who hasn't at least a bit of the time felt that. So where does patient care, patient-centered care fit in? I want to just briefly begin by going back to the, the origins of the term. It was first used in 1969, so it's been knocking around a long time. And it was first used by Enid Balint, who was a psychoanalyst, who I had the very deep privilege to know towards the end of her life. And two, together with her husband, Michael Balint, developed what some of you may have experienced may still be uh, using our, our, our Barlink groups. Now, she was really well aware of uh, uh, the relational aspects in healthcare. And she used this in the original, she used patient-centered care to distinguish it from, the, from a model of care which talked about the pneumonia in bed 16, or the UTI in bed 15, where the patient was reduced to a particular symptom. And shortly before her death, she wrote this. At the in, this was in 1993, and she died the following year. At the center of medicine, there is always a human relationship between a patient and a doctor. This is the unchanging core of medical work, despite whatever technical advances are made. And my contention, in a way, is very, very simple. My contention is that the unchanging core has changed and that the human relationship is something that gets lost, not all the time, but at least some of the time, that human relationship is what we've lost. And this uh, is Kieran Sweeney, is Kieran Sweeney, Professor Kieran Sweeney, he was a professor of general practice at Peninsula Medical School in the UK. And he was diagnosed with mes mesothelioma as at about 50, when he was about 50 or 51. And he wrote a paper that I would commend everybody to, write, to read in the BMJ. It's an amazing paper about his experience as a GP, as professor of general practice, an academic GP, his experience of being diagnosed and treated for a, a disease which he knew would very rapidly kill him, which it did. And he talked about, in this paper, the transactions have been timely, technically impeccable, but the relational aspects of care lacked strong leadership and at key moments were characterized by a hesitation to be brave. And he, in the paper, he goes on to talk about how alone he felt with his diagnosis and how this aloneness was a key, uh, really added to and augmented his suffering. And we can see with the pressures of delivering ever more technically complex care to ever more patients, how the relational aspects, how helping patients not to feel alone can be overlooked. And this is what some of the doctors I see talk to me about, that they can't look after their patients in the way that they had envisaged when they entered the profession. Um, after patient-centered care, there was another, um, another sort of framework was put forward, and this was called relationship-centered care. It, it's sort of always been shadowed by patient-centered care. It came from a, a high-level task group that was uh, commissioned to look into how you could provide good quality care in the US, it's an American model, in the context of an aging population with much more chronic disease. And, and, and they acknowledged the importance of relationships, not just doctor-patient, but patient-nurse, doctor-nurse, uh, doctor-family, all the things. They, they, the relational aspects were put much uh, at the center 
They acknowledged that clinicians needed to look at, after their own health, but crucially, what didn't happen was there's nowhere in relationship-centered care that it's seen as an institutional responsibility to look after the staff, rather than it being matter, a matter for the individual. But the idea that there is an institutional responsibility to look after staff, um, it's not new. And to go back to Samuel Shem, he has a character, Chuck, who says, how can we care for patients if nobody cares for us? That just says it as it is. We cannot expect doctors, nurses, healthcare staff to care for patients if we don't care for them. So I'm now going to, I'm, I'm interested in the fact, Brown, we had very similar uh, 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 photos, really, uh, to take a, a step into maybe slightly uncharted territory in order to understand this idea of the relational aspects of care. And I'm going to make a very bold suggestion that we can just perhaps, perhaps, we can learn something about the essential nature of care if we look at the original locus of care in all of our lives, maternal care. Now, I am not suggesting, I want to be clear on this, I'm not suggesting, uh, and, and at the end I'll give the, this was an essay I wrote for the British Medical Journal, and it was peer-reviewed, and I didn't make this point clear enough in the original uh, version, and the peer reviewer wrote furiously, I don't feel about my patients as I feel about their children. And she was right, I needed, to, I needed to make this much, much clearer. So I'm not saying doctors, nurses should feel about their patients as they feel about their children, no. What I am saying is that if we look at the psychodynamics and we look at some of the, what's going on psychologically when we think about uh, maternal care, it can illuminate aspects which get overlooked and we don't really consider when we think about medical care. So, I'm going to begin with Donald Winnicott. Many of you may have heard of him. He was a pediatrician, psychoanalyst. Uh, he came up with the terms transitional object, the good enough mother, all sorts of things which have gone into common parlance. And he allegedly stood up at a very, very sort of dry psychoanalytic meeting when somebody was talking about the baby, the baby, talking about infant development. And he said, there's no such thing as a baby. A baby can exist alone, but is essentially part of a relationship. And Winnicott also understood that motherhood is not always like this. It is not always like motherhood and apple pie. And in an absolutely brilliant paper that he wrote 70 years ago, 1949, called Hate and the Counter-Transference, is available online, he gives 14 reasons why mothers may hate their babies. Uh, he, the baby's ruthless, treats her as scum, an unpaid servant, a slave. He is suspicious, refuses her good food, and makes her doubt herself, but eats well with his aunt. <laughs> he then goes on to suggest that there can be a correlate of this hatred in the therapeutic relationship. Yet this fundamental insight hasn't permeated the practice of medicine. And instead, the doctors I see often feel ashamed to talk about feelings of resentment or disdain or disgust or fear or whatever towards the patient. And the literature on patient-centered care, it's all like this. It's all like this. And where is it? Where are doctors allowed to express the idea that actually the palette of feelings about the patient is much, much broader. Now, of course, Winnicott was not arguing that mothers should act on their hateful feelings, or psychotherapists, or psychiatrists, or any, any, any healthcare provider, but he was suggesting that it was helpful for mothers, psychiatrists, any, any other healthcare providers to understand that these feelings are not uncommon. And the feelings only become problematic when they're either repressed or they're acted upon. 
I mean, repressed to the extent that you, you, you can't deny them, and then you were, it's what that starts to happen is, is that you actually, you're driven to a sort of compulsion to be quite the opposite, which can be exhausting. Where besides Barlink groups can medical students and doctors go to have an open, non-judgmental discussion of any of this stuff? The second thing I think we can learn from maternal care is about maternal depression. Um, it, it's common, as, as many people will know in this room, and although prior psychological difficulties increase the risk, the quality of mother's network of support is also crucial. A badly supported mother, a mother with a poor relationship with her partner, poor relationship with maybe her parents or in-laws, not well supported by a group of friends, is more likely to become depressed. And I think that the emotional weight of bearing responsibility for a new infant's life, the exhaustion, the fear of something going wrong, the isolation if the mother is poorly supported, it can take a toll on the new mother. But it also, I think there is a correlate in the medical, when we think of particularly very early on in doctor's training, when they're suddenly overwhelmed by the responsibility. And this year, uh, FY2, second year, foundation year two, who had, uh, I was seeing, who, who came to talk to me about the difficulties she was experiencing at work. And actually, she was in Scotland, I'm in London, we, our sessions were done over the phone, and she just came out with this stream of consciousness. And it seemed to me so deeply resonant of, of some of the issues that new mothers could experience. I'm run ragged. I can't look after the patients in the way that I want. I've been shouted at by my seniors. I'm all by myself in this giant hospital covering the post-surgical ward while my seniors are in theater. I feel so alone. And again and again, I hear junior doctors describe this, and I think it is a kind of medical correlate of the maternal dynamic, where there's exhaustion, the burden of responsibility, and the ever-growing fear of making a mistake, and the lack of support from other colleagues. So, I don't want to fall into the trap of looking at everything that happened 20 to 30 years ago through rose-tinted glasses. We don't want to go back to the hideous hours or the sexism and racism described in books like The House of God. Hell no. But equally, we don't want to fall into the trap of saying that the current difficulties do doctors experience because they're snowflakes. Instead, I think we need to think much more psychologically about the ways in which relationships have been eroded over the last 20 to 30 years. And I'll give you a few examples. Larger medical school intakes. I don't know the extent to which this is an issue here, but in the, in, if we take the London medical schools, only one has not joined up. Where there were 13, I think they're now five. King's has uh, 500. Bart's and the London is now going to be moving to 600 per year. You get lost, a student can fall beneath the radar in that sort of, uh, with those sorts of numbers. Foundation doctors now move all over the country. And in my book, I describe how the, the, the inverse care law works out that the weakest doctors, those who are struggling the most, are going to get sent furthest away from home and end up with least support. Rotations now, foundation rotations, last four rather than six months. So just at the point when a doctor's beginning, a very new doctor is beginning to think, maybe I can do this, maybe this is okay, it's musical chairs, they're moved around again. Sometimes that four months is subdivided into two times two months. So how can they get to know people, how can they sort of felt, uh, form good supportive relationships? How can they build up a sense of confidence? Doctors live off site, removal of the doctor's mess, replacing the old style firm, all of these, and this list is not in any way exhaustive. 
We also have the case of Dr. Hadiza Bawagaba in the UK, a shameful case where a, a doctor was accused of man, a medical manslaughter. She was struck off. She, the fact that she had... Uh, she just returned after maternity leave. There'd been no induction. The fact that her consultant was away that weekend, the fact that the computer systems weren't working, and the way that all of these structural things contributed to the tragic death of, 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 of a young boy from sepsis. But I think that that has struck fear in the hearts of junior doctors, not only in the UK. In March, I was in Australia, uh, giving some talks, and I was really moved to hear about how Australian doctors had crowdfunded, had contributed to the crowdfunding, which enabled her to appeal, and eventually she was reinstated. And of course, racism as well. That's another part of what was going on in this case. Um, so, what's the answer? I'm not going to name and shame, but I can tell you that this is not the answer. So this is, was a paper last year, the conclusion, a good healthcare professional is one who is compassionate to themselves and their own well-being, enabling them to care and treat their patients. Well, that is just a little part, but in of itself, it is not the answer. And putting it down to the individual doctors is not the way forward. Instead, I think we need to look at things very differently. And in the final chapter of my book, I come up with a bit of a, a mad rant, in a way. Um, when I talk about, I think what we need to have is parity between the infective and the affective. And what I mean by that is I think that rather than trying to see this as a problem of the... the as lack of individual resilience, lack of individual self-compassion, if we really want to improve the emotional well-being of doctors, the best model we can look for is that of infection control. And that's why I came up for the, uh, the conclusion about the parity between the infective and the affective. And why? Why did I come up with this mad idea? Well, 150 years ago, this is this guy's jo Joseph Blister, and 150 years ago, people laughed at him. They laughed when he said, do you know what, guys? It might be a really good idea if we wash our hands post-amputation. It might be quite a good idea if we wash our hands with carbolic acid before we go and amputate the next leg. Um, and even though post-operative sepsis and gangrene fell dramatically with the simple mechanisms of washing their hands and scrubbing down the operating uh, in, in the theatre with carbolic acid, his colleagues said, no, that's nonsense. It's too slow. It's too time-consuming. Anyway, it's all to do with better ventilation that you've had this drop in sepsis. Um, and... If you think about it nowadays, in contemporary medicine, infection control permeates every single aspect of medical care. You couldn't have all the surgeries, the transplantation, patients couldn't be put through chemo. All those advances are actually predicated on infection control, which is why antimicrobial existence is such, a, you know, is such a, an enormous threat. Uh, and we just sort of take this for granted. But just over 150 years ago, it was laughed at. And I think what we're doing currently is that we are doing the, in terms of our thinking about the well-being of doctors and the, wealth, uh, the, the clinical workforce more generally, we are doing the equivalent of putting up those signs in the toilet saying, now wash your hands, please and thinking that that is infection control covered. That's what we're doing. But I don't want to end on an, uh, a sort of sad or, or, or dire note, and I think that there is just a little wind of change. This guy is Professor Michael West. He's an organizational psychologist. Previously, he's worked for the King's Fund, and he's tasked with heading up a GMC commission uh, into the well-being of the medical workforce. 
His findings are supposed to be published this month, but they haven't been published yet. But for some reason, in August, he wrote an, uh, an article in The Psychologist, which is the professional... Uh, it's not, it's, not the, it's not the British Journal of Psychology, but it's not psychologies, are there? The Psychologist is the professional magazine of, um, psycho of the British Psychological Society. And I think that maybe my infection control comparison about that's the, that's the sort of lens with which we need and the ambition with which we need to think about staff well-being um, is... I think that's starting to happen. And he said this. In, in, so he was writing about his research in The Psychologist last month. The, the intent is that we will identify the factors in doctors' workplaces that need to be changed in order to deal with the problems they are facing. We'll design or provide examples of interventions that are most likely to make a difference to the working lives of doctors and trainees. These interventions will not be, they will not be focused on health and well-being programs such as mindfulness and exercise, good though these things are. They'll be focused on changing the workplace factors that damage doctors' health and well-being. Some of those will be familiar, such as the quality of team working, supervision, bullying and harassment, discrimination, justice and fairness, autonomy and control. There are also hygiene factors to do with rotors, long hours, not having places to sleep at night. Mike, you might be pleased, Mike Farker, who's speaking later and who's done amazing work on this. Not having places to sleep at night when you're on call, not having anywhere to get a hot drink or something to eat. For junior doctors, there's the problem they're being bounced from organization to organization during their training, not establishing any continuity regarding work relationships and supervisions. The major problem almost all NHS staff face is excessive workload. That's having a huge impact on staff turnover, sickness absence, and recruitment. We'll also look at the challenges of subgroups of doctors, the particular challenges they face, for example, doctors in emergency medicine who are working in very pressurized environments. And both UK and international black and minority ethnic doctors who face high levels of discrimination, dis disciplinary processes, and differential pro promotion. I read that sitting on my holiday in August, and I wanted to go, yes! Yes, this is not mindfulness, great though that is. This is not exercise. This is a fundamental rethinking about the scale of the problem and what needs to be done. And I think it's very interesting how many of the things he writes about um, are the quality of team working, supervision, bullying, discrimination, moving around the country. These are things about relationships. So, if you want to, it's open access, the, the article is there. We need to remind ourselves that staff well-being is important because, uh, the, it's important because to deliver quality patient care, the care must first and foremost be safe. And the findings from this is a large systemic review remind us that staff well-being plays an important role in patient safety and patient well-being. So, this is what's wrong with patient-centered care. It's too individualistic. Great medical care, as Enid Barlint argued, is predicated on a relationship between the doctor and the patient. And as Chuck from House of Gods remind us, reminds us, if we only look after the patients without caring for the doctors, then ultimately both will suffer. It's about relationships, and there's a link to the BMJ article where some of this stuff, uh, if you want any of the references, they're linked to that. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>